Yeah, the Prince Who Would Buy America, 146. While the fundamentalists might have been condemning the United States as the leader of the new Crusades, prominent Saudi businessmen were continuing to make the great Satan their prime investment. There are no official figures provided by either government. The Saudis, when they started investing with their oil embargo profits in 1974, struck a deal with Treasury Secretary William Simon that the U.S. government would never disclose specific figures for the Saudi money coming into America. Are you fucking shitting me? My God. <whistles> Treasury Secretary William Simon, 1974. The House of Saud did not want to be accused of buying America. Oh my God, Joe. This is what Come happened. On, you get past I apologize, but like, after, I mean, just to see where it led, like from cooking the books as a naval intelligence officer for Dulles, now understanding better who Dulles was, right. that Dulles was the lawyer for Tissen at the same time he was the lawyer for the Bushes, as, he, as they at, he provided a front for Nazi bank and the provisions provided to the Third Reich during the Second World War, yeah. that was a, aiding and abetting the enemy, you bet your ass. And I, they made him president. They made the little mailroom boy, Nixon, the one who delivered the messages and just kept his mouth shut. They fucking made him president and then they handed it over to Saudi Arabia. This is 1974. <clears throat> the House of Saud did not want to be accused of buying America, and as a result, despite repeated efforts by Congress and private groups to get the figures, the Treasury Department has relied on two laws, the Bretton Woods Agreement Act and the International Investment Survey Act to claim it cannot release information about individual investors, which it considers Saudi Arabia to be. Financial analysts, however, have made a concerted effort to obtain an accurate picture of how much Saudi money is in the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. This requires that investments in public American companies be disclosed only if they exceed 5% of the firm's value. That means that many investments are made under the radar where foreign investors keep their money under the 5% threshold. Those are more difficult to accurately calculate. Also, it is hard to determine the extent of Saudi real estate purchases as many of those are done through an intricate layer of offshore banks and third country corporations. Represented by a combination of American and foreign law firms, that are not required to disclose any details about their furtive clients. None of the real estate deals made through such complex financial arrangements are illegal or connected to money laundering, but rather are constructed for the very purpose of providing as much legally available privacy as possible. For the Saudis, it has worked well, leaving most investigators only making educated guesses at the amount of America the kingdom now owns. And this book was written when? In like 80 something? <laughs> like, this book was written, okay, see, 2005, I guess, well, it's fairly, uh, so, you know, 15 years ago, it's 15 years old, right, this book. Okay. But things like this tend to maybe have a pop-up phase like this. Um, <clears throat> None of the real estate meal days, deals made through such complex financial are illegal. Most common, the most common estimate is that the Saudis have about six hundred billion in America. This is in two thousand and five. That dwarfs the investment by any other country. After nine eleven, when the mood in the United States swung against the Saudis for their seemingly cavalier attitude toward reigning in extremists and several lawsuits, yeah, not, not about who was actually flying the planes, by the way, 
just about their <clears throat> not cracking down on the training of them back home. Um, and several lawsuits were filed on behalf of the victims of the terror attacks against Saudi officials and banks. Some financial commentators predicted that a withdrawal of Saudi investments was imminent. A figure widely bandied about was that the kingdom's investors would yank up to $200 billion out of the U.S., fearing that the money might be attached in some future legal proceeding and that the investment, <coughs> investment environment in America had become inhospitable. Oh, no such fears. No worries. I've got your back. A year after the terror attacks, the kingdom's larger, largest investment Sorry, the king's largest investor in the United States, King Fahd's nephew, Prince Al Wahid bin Talal bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud, took the British Broadcasting Corporation that senior members of the Saudi ruling told the British Broadcasting Corporation that senior members of the Saudi ruling family were not abandoning their American investments and in many in instances were actually increasing them. telling this to the big brother of the family, because it's all one big happy family. I'm holding on to all of them, my investments, and in all honesty, increasing my stakes in certain companies in the U.S., Abin al Saud had said. When asked about the rumors of large withdrawals, he said he had read the stories, found them surprising, and that my information tells me none of this is correct. <laughs> my information tells me. It's nice for your information to tell you something. So you're not wrong. Just the information that told you something <laughs> that you hold to be true is wrong. But we see. Okay. See a lawyer. <clears throat> uh, what I am telling you represents the position of the Saudi royal family 100%. There is no better source for such information than 48-year-old Prince Al-Wafid. He is the prince who, more than any other, is single-handedly buying America. Time magazine hailed him as the Arabian Warren Buffett. Business Week once said Al-Khwalid is probably the most important financial kingpin that you've heard of, and said but by 2010, he could be the most powerful businessman on earth. Al-Khwalid was born in 1957 to Prince Talal bin Abdul Aziz, one of the many sons of the late King Ibn Saud. Mona El Sol, the daughter of Lebanon's first post-independence prime minister, Riyadh El Sol. His father <coughs> emerged during the 1950s as the leading voice of a small cadre of liberal princes, known as free princes, who pushed for political reform in the House of Saud. As the 1960s began, Prince Talal proposed a drafting a constitution and forming an elected consultative council. This is the 1960s? As the 1960s began, Prince Talal proposed a drafting a constitution and forming an elected consult, um, consultative council. Um, yeah. Not only did King Saud reject the ideas, but religious leaders issued a fatwa condemning them as violations of Islamic law. In 1961, the House of Saud canceled Talal's passport and tried to muffle him, muzzle him. He left for Cairo, where he declared himself a socialist and broadcast anti-Saudi radio propaganda, earning the nickname The Red Prince. <clears throat> in 1964, Talal reconciled with the royal family and was allowed to return to the kingdom, so long as he did not express any more political views. He agreed, and for the next two decades focused on business, primarily construction and real estate. In those enterprises, he earned a small fortune. <clears throat> Talal's son, Prince al Khalid left Saudi Arabia at 19 in 1976 to attend Menlo College, just outside of San Francisco. Is it Menlo or Menlo? Menlo? He later told Business Week, from the age of 16, I realized I wanted a plane and a boat to make money. At Menlo College, the, st the prince studied business, and upon graduating with honors, returned to Saudi Arabia in 1979 to take advantage of the post-embargo petro boom that was still sweeping the kingdom. By the time Al Khalid went home, Saudi Arabia was already a multi-billion dollar investor in America. Four years after the embargo, Saudi Arabia had become, for instance, the largest holder of Federal National Mortgage Association, or Fannie Mae. The housing market, Joe. 
Remember, I always told you it was consolidated at some point, right. but I hadn't properly displaced the referent, right? Continue, continue. For instance, the largest holder of Fannie Mae notes held about 40 billion separately in U.S. securities. In those early years, the Saudis picked relatively low-key companies in which to put their money, and often favored conservative ones in banking, investments, or industrial production. For instance, amongst initial Saudi investments were brokerage firms Smith Barney and Donaldson Lufkin Jenrette. Banks like the National Bank of Georgia, the Commonwealth of Missouri, and the Main Bank of Houston, and for individual firms, North Carolina Aluminum Smelters, Coastal and Offshore Plants System, Delaware Trucker, Truckers RLC Corporation, Texas-based Sunshine Mining, and Colorado Land and Cattle Company. But that soon changed as Saudis began investing in major corporations that were household names in most American homes. Al Walid would eventually lead this change. When he had returned to Saudi Arabia, he started earning his own personal fortune the same way many of his royal companies did, by becoming an agent for foreign companies wanting to do business in the kingdom. In 1980, the prince mortgaged a house given to him by his father and started his own firm, Kingdom Establishment. His first deal was an $8 million contract with a South Korean company to build a bachelor's club at a military academy near Ridya. Unlike many Saudi royals who were content just to earn fat commissions on business deals with foreigners, the 23-year-old Al-Walid had great grander ambitions. A self-acknowledged workaholic, he aggressively pursued joint ventures with foreign companies, landing construction deals and lucrative military contracts. By his mid-twenties, he was raking in profits of more than $50 million annually, his early investments were conservative, with most of his spare money going into real estate in and around Ridya. It was a smart move, since he caught a wave of real estate appreciation that ballooned his personal worth over a few years. While many Saudi princes might have stopped at that point, Al Walid wanted much more. So in the mid-1980s, not yet 30, he returned to the United States to pursue a master's degree in social sciences at, NY, at New York's Syracuse University. Larry became convinced that the American banking system was ripe for growth. When he returned to Saudi Arabia, he did something that was enough heard of. He launched a hostile takeover of one of the kingdom's banks, the unprofitable United Saudi Commercial Bank, USCB. Filled with fresh ideas about how to turn companies around, he slashed the USCB staff from 600 to 250, and introduced management incentives, then virtually non-existent in Saudi Arabia, and the bank became profitable in just two years. With his new revenue, he expanded his little empire to include the kingdom's largest supermarket chain, then branched out into such diverse fields as hospital management, livestock, and even fast food outlets. Satisfied that his Saudi base was now solid, al Walid turned briefly to mixing philanthropy and politics. So who did he meet when he was in New York? Like he was studying the social sciences. It doesn't say a degree in public, and it doesn't say he obtained it. It says that was the, the stated purpose, but it sounds more like he became man, you know, like someone who was, you know, very familiar in Western ways of business management. I mean, he might have just, whatever, brought that knowledge back, but they're not saying it's pu public administration or that it's, you know, like an MBA, it's just social sciences was his degree. So at any rate, just something in put for you. His uh, major, satisfied that his Saudi base was now solid, Al Walid turned briefly to mixing phil philanthropy and politics, supporting the Mujahideen fighters in their jihad against Soviet troops in Afghanistan. It was a major financial, financial, financial supporter of the Afghan Arab militias and traveled secretly to their training camps in Peshawar. His last sizable donation to Mujahideen, 5.4 million, was in April 1990, shortly after the Soviets had left and the country was beginning its descent into civil war. But by that time, al Wali had also turned his attention to investing some of his newfound money into America. In 1987, he had examined the then ailing banks in the United States. He began acquiring shares of Chase Manhattan Citibank, Manufacturers Hanover and Chemical Bank. 
Oh my God. Chase Manhattan, Citibank, Manufacturers Hanover, and Chemical Bank. Sometimes he called it Hanover. In Manufacturers Hanover. Sometimes he called in buy orders from a cellular phone while horseback riding in the desert. Within months, he had spent close to $250 million, at one point owning 2.3% of Chase. All the banks were having difficulties in a tough market, and their shares seemed like bargains to him. In 1990, he profitably sold his stakes in three of the banks and funneled $207 million into Citibank, acquiring a 4.9 stake through stock purchases, just under the 5% that would have triggered public disclosure by the SEC rules, 4.9%. So that was obvious, obviously a um, MO. Yeah. The savings in the loan de debacle had shaken Wall Street's confidence. Let's see, by the autumn of 1990, the bank, then America's largest, was in worse condition than well, when Al Khalid originally invested. The savings and loan debacle had shaken Wall Street's confidence in financial institutions. Okay, we know there's a connection in the, this whole story there. Citibank urgently needed an infusion of money, had hemorrhaged red ink on its property loans, and was widely exposed to third world loans that seemed uncollectible. It needed a 1.5 billion to survive, but was having difficulty finding investors. As fears mounted that Citibank might fail, its shares plunged by half. I was the only one in the world willing to talk to Citi, Al Walid later said. He decided to invest more money. But because that would put him above the SEC's 5% disclosure rule, he wanted advice in the most politic and savvy way to proceed as a foreigner, buying into America's largest bank. The Washington, D.C. law firm of Hogan and Hartson suggested he hire the Carlisle Group to navigate from there. Oh, what a wonderful web we un we. Um, the Washington-based Carlyle Group is one of the world's largest private equity firms, managing about $14 billion. They've earned a reputation for forging multi-billion dollar business deals between governments and the military-industrial complex. One of the reasons the Carlyle Group is so successful is that many of its senior officers are retired Carter, Reagan, and Bush administration officials who still wield influence in both business and government circles. Included in the Carlyle Group are ex-Reagan Secretary of Defense, Frank Carlucci, former Bush Secretary of State, James Baker, and Fred Malik, former Republican National Committee Chairman. Ex-President George H.W. Bush joined Carlyle in 1999, and among other tasks, has visited South Korea to lobby for business. John Major, the former British Prime Minister, joined Carlyle in 1998 to run its European Bureau. The Carlyle Group has extensive business with Saudi companies. One of the Saudi companies that later invested several million dollars into, other Car into the Carlyle Group was the Bin Laden organization. That connection became public when the Wall Street Journal broke the story on September 27, 2001. A month after that disclosure, an embarrassed Carlyle Group cut its ties with the Bin Laden family and refunded their money. In February of 1991, Osama Bin Laden was far from the minds of either the Carlyle Group or Walid, or Al Walid. Instead, American troops stationed in the kingdom were preparing to retake Kuwait from Iraq. It's not giving us the year, at least here, of the several million dollars invested into the Carlyle Group by Bin Laden. What year? It doesn't say. Okay, well here, in February 1991, Osama Bin Laden was far from the minds of either the Carlyle Group or al Khwalid. Instead, American troops stationed in the kingdom were preparing to retake Kuwait from Iraq. And Prince al Khwalid, guided by the Carlyle Group, spent 590 million to buy an additional 10% of Citibank. 
His timing was impeccable. Nineteen ninety. 1991, because it's the autumn of 1990 when Al-Khalid originally invests in Chase. He owns 2.3% of Chase and has to bail them out with 1.5 billion. And then Citibank, so then he's, so this is the next year Prince Al-Khalid, guided by the Carlyle Group, spent 590 million Okay, yeah, so this is after City Post. So the Carlyle Group is overseeing all of this. And the Saudis have already invested into them. So they spent $590 million to buy an additional 10% of Citibank. His timing was impeccable. Two weeks later, a syndicate of international investors ended Citibank's money crisis by putting another $600 million into the bank. Into a syndicate of international investors. The fuck does that mean? Come on. <laughs> don't do this to us. I mean, don't be a lazy researcher either. Al-Khalid's cash infusion had effects on the bank in ways that few could have foreseen. CEO John Reed, a Manhattan Society insider, probably could never have imagined that a couple of years later, he and his son would fly to Saudi Arabia and don Bedouin robes for a late-night party at Al-Khalid's high-tech encampment. 30 miles outside of Ridya, complete with a roast ca with roast camel, Bedouin dancers, and some target practice with machine guns. CEO John Reed, wait. Al Walid's cash infusion had effects on the bank in ways that few could have foreseen. CEO John Reed, a Manhattan Society insider, probably never could have imagined that a couple of years later, he and his son, would fly to Saudi Arabia and don Beju and robes for a late night party at Al Khalid's high tech encampment 30 miles outside Rigya, complete with the roast camel, Beju and dancers, and some target practice with machine guns. By April 1998, after Citibank announced plans to merge with travelers, that's when I was working there. I was working at, um, in uh, 1998. That was in New York City when they conducted the mergers. In April 1998, after Citibank announced plans to merge with travelers, the value of Al Khalid's under $1 billion stake in the company, now called Citigroup, had climbed to $7.6 billion. So, and this is also when the Monica Lewinsky stuff started breaking, when they put the pressure, well, this is when they removed Glass-Steagall. Look at how concerted an effort this is. At the same time, the Saudis move to consolidate power by seizing key assets of the United States infrastructure in a colon-calculating way, as that um, flying under the radar under 5% investment dis, you know, needed to trigger disclosure move indicates, right? Explain to me exactly uh, the details. I get a little confused. The Glass-Steagall Act. The Glass-Steagall Act was what was put in place after the, Grand, the Great Depression right. as a firewall between community banks where you put your money so you can bank and do your, pay your mortgage and buy your groceries and do your usual thing, um, and bank investment banks that use money to invest in the stock market. They're separate types of banks. And there was supposed to be a firewall so that ordinary people's money could not be put at risk by banks gambling with it. Right. But of course, you know, so by 1998, so this is when they were trying to pass the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, and those were the senators involved. Leach, <laughs> Bliley, and Graham. And uh, yeah, so they, um, the uh, effect of that act was to remove the firewall. But it's not just that that happened at a time when gambling was occurring, you know, was then able to occur. 
with ordinary people's assets. It was happening in the hands of a foreign power, the Saudis, and it, you can see it was concerted. It was coordinated and concerted and planned effort to do this because they had acquired stock in Fannie Mae. They had acquired stock in the mortgage market. They acquired the control of the banks. They were moving to control the banks at the same time that the banks were becoming completely dependent on them. Then they removed the firewall, enabling them to seize the hard assets, the real estate and homes of the bulk of the American public. This is a war, a crime against the United States of America and the Carlyle Group aided and abetted them. And there's ample evidence that they've been working against the interests of the United States of America for a fuck long time. One has to define what that translates into. I mean, in terms of working against the interest of... They sold us to the Saudis. They pimped us out to the Saudis. That's what it means. It means the reason your, your son has no future, my brother has no way to retire now. The American public is in a deeper depression than, you know, we've got 33 million unemployed so far. That's the result of being handed over to a foreign interest, an enemy of the United States of America by a, 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 a family, a dynasty, and a power that has been masquerading as working in the interests of this country for so long that they have now burrowed into the heart of our system and we are dying. It is time to extract the worm. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, it just starts to be so clear and it's so upsetting. By April 1998, after Citibank announced plans to merge with Travelers, the value of Al Khwalid's under $1 billion stake in the company, now called Citigroup, had climbed to $7.6 billion. It's now worth over $10 billion. That put the both um, Alquilid and the Carlyle Group on the map. Alquilid's acquisition of part of Citigroup was followed over the next decade by significant investments in other poorly performing blue chip American and European companies. The portfolio he collected as a bargain hunter is eclectic, typically composed of minority stakes in everything from media, telecoms, information systems, retailing, property, entertainment, hotel management, and dot coms. In 1994, for instance, he made headlines by buying 24% of Euro Disney for $360 million, another Carlyle broker group broker deal. That same year, the prince made waves in Europe when an Al Khwalid led alliance built, beat out Rupert Murdoch by bill, bidding $1.2 billion for a stake in the TV empire of his current Italian prime minister, Silvio Berlusconi. In 1995, he grabbed a 50% stake in New York Plaza's hotel for $160 million and 10% of London's enormous Canary Wharf. The latter was part of a consortium headed by Lawrence Tisch, the later business tycoon from New York, the late business tycoon from New York. He also added control of Saks Fifth Avenue upscale chain of stores and a significant ownership interest in the ultra-lux hotel chain, The Four Seasons. In February of 1997, he invested in a relatively new internet service provider called America Online, AOL. He eventually put more than $2 billion into it. The following month, he acquired a 5% stock in, April, in Apple after shares had plummeted from $50 to 18 Hold on right there. Let me think about what you just read. And that same month, he bought 5% of TWA stock. You remember, you remember who, it, now it's very interesting, this AOL, it was used by a lot of fucking people who didn't understand the internet, and that was huge. And I was thinking about AOL just yesterday, of how many, when, they, when AOL came out, you couldn't go any fucking where in this country without having these CDs freely taken. So many of them, people decorated shit with them. 
know? I wasn't in the country when that happened. Okay, but, so yeah. here's the point. Nobody that really understood anything about the internet liked AOL. And yet, there, there's a certain things that have happened which is very important. One of the key things was uh, Tom Hanks made a huge movie, a love movie, which is the premise called You Got Mail. And this was the, the voice yeah, was good of test. AOL. You Got Mail. Very, very cute and personal, kind of like Meg the whole thing. So here's what gets very interesting. Some years later, this this fucked up internet provider, AOL, ends up purchasing Warner Brothers or Warner. So then you end up having AOL slash Warner, not Warner slash AOL. In other words, they acquired mm -hmm. Warner. And like, that's a very, that's a big fucking deal. Because I'll tell you what, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a big fucking deal. The that's Prince Who Would Buy America, that's the chapter title. So, carrying on. Um, in February of 19, okay, so Boeing was next, his next target. In 1999, so this is 1990, okay, Boeing was his next target. In 1999, Al-Khalid became the controlling shareholder of Compact Computer. He was bought out when Hewlett Packard merged with it two years later. That same year, he put substantial money into Xerox. By 2000, Al-Khalid had moved new money into other high-tech firms such as eBay, Amazon, Priceline.com, AT&T, WorldCom, Masun Microsystems, and Kodak. It's, 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 Amazon yeah. and eBay was on that, were on that list. What? He spent over a billion dollars acquiring high-tech shares. He rushed money in 2001 into deflated share prices as internet ventures like drugstore.com, doubleclick.com, Infospace, Netscape, and Internet Capital Group. In the past few years, Al Valid has added substantial, so they're not really going into it, but when they mention deflated share prices, I mean, this is in the wake of 9-11, you know, we had deflated share, and, you know, so think about what a buying frenzy, think about the double humiliation of that, like the attack, and then when we're at our weakest, our enemies who had attacked us in the first place are buying us. They're using that opportunity when the prices were in deflated, share prices were deflated to buy. Al Khalid has additional substantial investments in Pepsi, Procter and Gamble. Among his latest ventures, he bought stakes in Ford Motors, the News Corp, the parent company of the New York Post, and the Fox News Channel. His 3% stake is second only to Rupert Murdoch's. Time Warner and also Motorola. Although Al Khalid has favored high tech firms, he has not completely avoided more traditional companies. He bought a quarter of Planet, the Planet Hollywood restaurant, restaurant chain. Among his many non-U.S. investments are such high-profile companies as England's premier advertising firm, Saatchi and Saatchi, Korean car makers, Daiwa and Hyundai, and Norwegian cruise lines. There is no doubt that Al Walid is energetic, articulate, and tireless. A thrice-divorced prince has built a sterling reputation among other international business titans and they respect his grasp of details and his hands-on approach to his investments. In his Ritya offices, not far from his 317-room castle, he has assembled a young, aggressive team of hard-working advisors who emulate his success. Eight television monitors are turned on at all times to international business and news channels. Al Khalid prides himself on needing only five hours of sleep nightly and of being involved in the minutiae of his, empi of his empire. Some financial commentators have greatly rankled him by suggesting he could be a frontman for a larger consortium of senior-level Saudi royals anxious to buy a sizable piece of America, but not wanting the glare of publicity. Many have assumed the slim 5-foot-8-inch, 140-pound Al Walid Business Week wrote in a detailed 1995 profile is a one-man investment front for other more publicly sh publicity-shy Saudi princes. Some have whispered about contracts to build secret military bases in Saudi Arabia 
or even fat commissions on oil shipments. Al Khalid himself hasn't done much to quell the rumors. In 1999, the respected British business magazine, The Economist, included that the prince has not earned enough from his investments to pay for his massive stock purchases in the 1990s and may have a, a valuable and unrevealed source of income. Prince Alawid is the modern face of the Saudi royalty, but his sums don't add up. His business empire has a mystery at its heart. Based on extensive investigation of Al Khalid's SEC filings, as well as interviews with the prince and his entourage, the economist raised doubts about the true extent of his success as a stock market investor and whether Saudi real estate deals could have reproduced enough or produced enough money to launch his 1990 American business spree. The Economist asked, where did the money come from? The mystery starts with his first major investment, the 1997 money that went into Citibank. Al Khalid is adamant that it came only from personal funds. He started out, he claims, with a loan of just $35,000 from his father, something that Business Week once dubbed an implausible story. He also mortgaged a house that his father had given him, raising him about 400000 and each month, as a grandson of the kingdom's founder, Ibn Saud, he received a stipend of between fifteen and nineteen thousand dollars. But somehow, by 1991, he was able to risk seven hundred ninety-seven million on a possibly failing American bank. The Federal Reserve Board must approve any investor's purchase of more than ten percent of an American bank. After Al Khalid had raised his stake in Citibank, he filed an application at the end of 1991 asking the Fed to approve his purchase. Most applications are approved within 60 days. After 14 months, the Fed had still not given the prince's application the green light. Despite aggressive lobbying by his American lawyers, Al Khalid says he got the message and saying he had to play by the rules of America, sold just enough shares to bring his ownership under 10%. The Fed is the only regulatory body ever to have publicly investigated Prince Al Khalid. It will not officially comment on why it did not approve his application, but it appears that it was affected by breaking news that began in the spring of 1991 about the unraveling BCCI bank fraud. Oh my God, all comes together. BCCI is um, a front that was being used to traffic a lot, of, a lot of kids, first of all, for Saudi parties, like you read about, with the camels and the, and the, and the, and the uh, automatic weapons and stuff. Um, BCCI. Yeah, that came up in a lot of reporting, and it came up in um, Whitney Webb's reporting. Um, it has, so what's it say about this? Um, it involved Pakistani Saudis and other layers of investors hidden behind a few apparently clean frontmen and businesses. Since the Fed could not be absolutely certain that all of Al Walid's money was his own, they evidently decided it would be safer if he cut his holdings to under 10%. I mean, this goes back to Roy Cohen. This goes back to the, the 50s and 60s. Pakistan. Um, Citibank was only the beginning. Since 1990, Al Khalid has invested about 4.5 billion in cash into different companies around the globe, but he rarely sells any investment and denies firmly that his money is either an inheritance or a gift. Al Khalid has always declared on federal regulatory filings that the money is his alone. He has seldom borrowed any funds, and then it is usually when he is buying hotels to borrow against the building he is buying, reducing his tax bill. And again, in his filings with federal regulators, the prince has declared he has not built his empire on secret debt. 
The Economist was troubled by the $1.5 billion of the $4.5 billion the prince had for investments. It was earned in the mid to late 1980s in buying and selling land in Saudi Arabia, says Al Khwalid. There are no public records of real estate deals in the kingdom, and Al Khwalid refuses to give specific examples, saying instead that by the early 1990s he had acquired 25 million square feet of prime Ridya real estate and 14 square miles of property just outside the city, making him the largest private landowner in the Saudi capital. Yet chartered surveyors who were working in the Middle East reported The Economist between 1986 and the Gulf War say the market was flat throughout that period. The slightest hint of corruption or malfeasance causes outrage among the prince and his family. In, his, in 1998, his father, Prince Talal, challenged anyone to come forward and provide me with documentary proof that Prince al Khalid accumulated this fortune by corrupt or illegal means. It would be almost impossible to come by such evidence even if it did exist. Prince al Khalid's enormous empire is anything but transparent. Most of his investments are held through a maze of companies registered in tax havens where total secrecy is guaranteed. In the Cayman Islands, more than 120 firms are registered under the corporate name used by Prince Al Khwalid, Kingdom 5 KR. The Prince says KR stands for the initials of his children's first names, but refuses to say what the five means, as it is confidential. So in the Cayman Islands, more than 120 firms are registered under the corporate name used by the Prince. Kingdom, K, um, Kingdom 5 KR. Whatever its intention, the effect of this complex financial structure is to obscure the trail of the prince's money outside Saudi Arabia. There is no doubt that high-ranking members of the House of Saud would not, for internal political reasons, be able to publicly undertake the types of investments that Al Khwalid pursues. The several chief executives of firms in which he has invested, such as Disney's Michael Eisner, Sanford Wheel of Travelers Group, and clothing designer Donna Karen, as well as some of the business partner, his business partners like Canadian real estate developer Paul Reichman or the late Lawrence Tisch, are Jewish. And no matter how close Al Khwalid is to the royal family, and how much he is admired as one of Saudi Arabia's greatest success stories, it has not spared him sharp criticism when the House of Saud thinks he's gone too far searching for a profit. A 1994 deal with pop star Michael Jackson to establish Kingdom Entertainment, a venture in which they promised to promote family values at a joint press conference, led to public rebukes from some Saudi royals. At the time, Jackson gushed about Al Khwalid. We want to create a new multimedia empire. The prince is sweet and humble, but at the same time very daring and wants to do incredible things, just like I do. Pull the off switch, put the on switch on. Such a robot. A couple of years earlier, Al Khwalid had one of his private jets bring Jackson for lunch to his ocean liner-sized yacht, then moored off the French Riviera Associates of Jackson said he was dazzled by Al Khalid's luxurious lifestyle and business acumen. I think it's after that he does those Egypt videos, those Egyptian. It's after 94. Anyway, 1997, Art Satellite Division, in which Al Khalid is the largest shareholder, broadcast the Miss Arab of Israel contest from Haifa. It earned him similar disapproval, although it is not clear such criticism is merely for public consumption inside the Wahhabi kingdom. Wahhabi kingdom. Behind the scenes, Al Khalid is actually has a green light for all his ventures from the House of Saud. The prince himself is quite sensitive to charges that his investments reflect a pro-Western bias. To bolster his own Wahhabi credentials, he has regularly donated huge sums to Muslim institutions and ensured that such gifts receive widespread news coverage inside the kingdom and the Arab world. He gives away nearly a hundred million annually. Among his bequests in December 2001, Al Khalid announced he would finance 50 new mosques in Saudi Arabia. 
These were in addition to the 39 mosques he had previously paid for. In May of 2002, he gave four million to the Grand Mosque in Carthage, Tunisia, two million to a Lebanese mosque. During a live 2002 telethon, he pledged 27 million to help build, rebuild Palestinian infrastructure, wow, destroyed by Israel, and to supply vehicles and clothing. He gave $6 million to Palestinians thrown out of work by the Intifada and helped reconstruct Lebanese power plants destroyed by the Israeli Air Force. On October 11th of 2001, precisely one month after the 9-11 attacks, <clears throat> al Khalid and his entourage visited New York and had a walking tour of Ground Zero with the city's mayor, Rudy Giuliani, and other city officials. At the time, he was ranked by Forbes magazine as the sixth wealthiest man in the world. He was fourth in the 2004 rankings, worth an estimated $21.5 billion. During his visit, he gave Giuliani a $10 million donation to the Relief Fund. It might have been seen as a magnanimous gesture and made al Walid an instant hit in America if it had not been for a written statement circulated later that same day by his publicist. In it, al Khalid said, Our Palestinian brethren continue to be slaughtered at the hands of the Israelis, while the world turns the other cheek. At times like this, we must address some of the issues that led to such a criminal attack. I believe the government of the United States of America should re-examine its policies in the Middle East and adopt a more balanced stance toward the Palestinian cause. Suggesting that America might be to blame for bringing such a horrific terror strike upon itself as a result of its Middle East policy produced a firestorm of public and media criticism. Giuliani, who said that he thought he had noticed al Khalid and others in his entourage smirking as they walked around the mass of ruins, angrily returned the donation al Khalid, furious at the snub, left the United States immediately for Saudi Arabia. Days later, in an interview with a Saudi newspaper, he blamed Giuliani's decision on Jewish pressures. He later told Newsweek, Giuliani never should have publicized the or politicized the matter. When asked if he had warned Giuliani that he would make a political statement, al Khalid, who is obviously not accustomed to anyone rejecting his money, said, it was none of his business. His business was to receive the check. Since the fiasco at Ground Zero, Al Khalid has avoided publicly challenging the Bush administration. His only other 9-11 related activity came in March of 2002, when he gave a million dollars to an Arab League fund intended to repair Western perceptions of Islam following the terror attacks. While al Khalid's rejected donation might be viewed in the West as a public relations debacle, in the Middle East, his confrontation with Giuliani transformed him from a super rich but politically marginal member of the Saudi royal family to one of the most respected figures in the Arab world. He again showed his credentials to the Arab street when he said after 9-11, there's no company in Palestine I'm not involved with. Oh, there's no company in Palestine I'm not involved with. In 2002, he donated millions to a Saudi government-sponsored telethon to raise money for Palestinian martyrs. <coughs> this fame may eventually translate into political power. Almost overnight, al Khalid became a regular part of any serious discussion about possible political contenders in the third generation of Saudi royals who will one day inherit power from the aging senior princes, now in line for succession to the crown. In the meantime, the prince has adopted a, pa a patient attitude toward his U.S. investments. He is confident that the anti-Saudi mood, pre present, uh, prevalent since 9-11, is merely a passing phase. The U.S. right now is in a mood that is unrealistic, says al Khalid. And I hope that once the dust settles, the U.S. government, people, and the media will go back to reality and normal. As for al Khalid, despite the torrent of religious leaders inside the kingdom who condemned the United States 
as a crusading imperialist that must be ostracized from the Arab world, he continues to invest in America. In February of 2004, Microsoft founder and chairman Bill Gates invited Al Khalid to dinner at his home to discuss business projects, including their joint investments in the Four Seasons hotels and res resorts. Al Khalid had earlier owned 50% of the Fairmont hotel chain. The prince offered to help Microsoft expand its operations in Saudi Arabia. That same month, Al Khalid met new in New York with Hank Greenberg, the chairman of American International Group, or AIG, the world's largest insurance company. Saudi Arabia is planning to require Saudi employers to provide health insurance for all employees, and Al Khalid is looking at whether AIG could get a contract inside the kingdom. While in America, he had private meetings with Steve Jobs, the head of Apple Computer, former President Bill Clinton at his Harlem office, their fourth get-together, Scott McNeely, CEO of Sun Systems, and Rick Braddock, chairman of Priceline.com. The chill in U.S.-Saudi relations has not slowed the prince who would buy America. That was in 2005. So, 